Good morning. Uh, my name is Barry Miller. I'm President and Chief Operating Officer of the DVRC. On behalf of the DVRC, our sponsors, partners, special guests, uh, we want to welcome all of you here this morning. Uh, as you can see, we have a fabulous turnout. Uh, the Manufacturing Leadership Series has been around for about three years. And uh, we basically, it's a very successful program as reported by you. Uh, the, the evaluation sheets, which you should have on your desk, uh, are very important to us. And we continue to hear from you that the sharing of best practices is really something you want to see and hear. Um, I would like to uh, uh, acknowledge and thank our sponsors that are here today. And if I could ask you to stand, that would be great. Uh, Citizens Bank. Thank you. Also, Fesnac and Associates. Uh, Anro Printing, and I'm not sure, are they here today? I think they had another event, but I do want to give them a plug because they provided all of our material that you have on your desk and any of the material for the event. Uh, they do an excellent job, and, and uh, if you a, have a need for printing, please consider them. And also, the U.S. Export Assistance Center. Uh, there we go. Uh, they're one of our strategic partners along, uh, one of our two strategic partners along with the World Trade Center to help uh, work with us on export for manufacturers. The, we were just talking this morning about the beautiful marriage that goes on between export and uh, manufacturing. Uh, so I'm, they're wonderful partners, so please, uh, if you get a chance this morning, uh, you know, introduce yourself to them because they're here to help you as well. Uh, as far as, uh, for those of you who are new to the DVIRC, uh, we are an economic development organization whose entire focus and mission is to grow business value for the small to mid-sized manufacturers in southeast Pennsylvania. Uh, we believe growing business value improves the standard of living and quality of life for those who live and work in the region. When we're talking about growing business value, what we're talking about is the value of your business as it might be perceived by a potential buyer. And what we're talking about that, even though you may not be interested in selling your business, uh, the fact is the most important metric for you as an owner and for business is the actual value of the business. So we want to, everything that we do in our business to go out and help manufacturers, we link behind the scenes, if you want to call it Intel Insider or whatever, we're constantly thinking about how can this enhance the value of, bus of the business we're working with. And so that's part of our you know, it's kind of our, our push and our drive is to try and help uh, companies think about that when they're going about and making investments in their business because they have limited dollars to do so. Um, our core competency at the DVRC is right-sizing large company practices for the small to mid-sized firms, taking the best practices that many of our staff and many of the third-party consultants we work with and so on that they help bring to us, and our job is to try and right-size that for the small to mid-sized uh, market area and uh, that's really kind of that's our core competency because when you look at the the 4,500 manufacturers that we have in our region and over 90 percent of those companies are less than 100 employees you know, and about 60 percent of those companies are less than 20 employees and that's the kind of the growth area that that really you know we're working with and we need to make sure that we do everything we can to help provide services uh, for those companies. Uh, some of the services that we provide, strategic planning, market sales, and new product development has been growing very nicely for us this year. A lot of companies are, I guess, as a result of the, the uh, recent recession and so on, are really starting to uh, say, hey, we really stepped to, to look at that particular area. Innovation and technology acceleration, uh, as they start to push on top line growth and try and introduce new products, they run into technical barriers. And, uh, DVRC has been able to work with some excellent players that if you've got technolo technological barriers that are preventing you from getting into a certain market, please let us know. We've got some great talent to help you with that. So, or if you're trying to find a new market, you've got a particular technology and you want to open up a new market, let us know. We can help you go after that as well. Uh, most of you are familiar with our lean uh, activities, our lean transformation, uh, headed up by Jeff Kapenitz and, and the lean group. Uh, they do a fabulous job, and, and we're continuing to see very strong growth there as well, uh, beyond what we had planned for this year. So uh, it's really moving uh, pretty, pretty uh, fast and furious for us at this point in time. Um, individual lear learning organizations, 
Uh, one of the things that we've got going there is really trying to help uh, embed a lot of these services into your organization, making it part of your culture, team-based training, and so on. So again, it's another area that we can, we can help you build. The last thing I want to mention is our executive network groups. They've grown almost 20% uh, this year. Uh, they continue, we continue to add members. There seems to be a lot of traction there. It's a, we have five groups right now, and I think we're really pressed to, to start the next group. Uh, this area is uh, something where companies can come and meet together and have a, a kind of a board of advisors that they can work with. Uh, there's, actually, there's members here in the room. Uh, if you happen to bump into some of the other players, they'll share their stories with you as well. So again, it's a very successful uh, opportunity uh, for you to get in and, and be able to kind of share uh, best practices, tour other people's facilities, and so on. Um, they typically run around 15 to 16 uh, members per group. Um, the DVIRC is also, just to shift gears, we're also involved in, in a variety of regional economic development projects. One of those is GPIC. Uh, it's called the Greater Philadelphia Industry, uh, Innovation Cluster, and it's located down at the Navy Yard. Uh, you may have heard about this. This is the piece where we're working on the energy efficient uh, building envelope uh, for energy in the United States. It's a DOE project. There's about $130 million that's been focused with 90 uh, partners and, and members in, at the Philadelphia Navy Yard. The goal is this. There's basically five million buildings in the United States, and those five million buildings consume about 40% of all the electricity and all the power, I should say, in the United States. The goal is to try and go after those buildings and be able to make it cost effective for them to reduce their energy costs by 50%, and the investment to do so would have a payback of less than three years. That's the goal. It's a three to five year program. Uh, it, is, it is very large in scale. It's a regional opportunity. It's one of a kind. It's only here in Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia region. DVIRC is also working with the New Jersey MEP to also pull that together. And we're, our job is to go out and reach out to manufacturers who are working in this particular arena and also get them uh, engaged in this area that they can um, either participate by providing technology or they can help produce the parts. And by the way, another side benefit of this is also the whole work workforce requirements that are going to be needed to help support this new industry uh, that we see emerging. Basically, it's going to be an integration of all existing technologies with new technologies being added. So we're really excited about that. There, you'll hear more about it. There, you do should have a brochure. If you don't, uh, I'll have the business development players stand up later in the meeting. Uh, so you'll be able to know who they are. This is a, the GPIC brochure, describes it in more detail. If you are interested, there's a short, short survey. It says get, getting started inside. Uh, go out, it'll give you a sense of all the technologies that they're looking at. Uh, and you can fill that in, your name will get into the, the database. We can come out and visit with you. We're also going to be holding uh, uh, events down at the Navy Yard. You can sign up and come down and, and participate and learn more. Um, say so just shifting gears. Uh, the, the other piece that I want to mention is we recently conducted a state of manufacturing report. It's, it was actually the challenges and opportunities. The seven IRCs, or seven industrial resource centers in the state, um, we decided that we really needed, given all of the issues that were, uh, that were occurring as a, um, as a result of the economy and the impact in the manufacturing sector, to really try and and make sure that we understood just how important manufacturing was to Pennsylvania. So for example, uh, right now manufacturing in Pennsylvania is 13.6% of our gross state product. It is the largest, it's the largest um, industry sector in the state. We uh, employ about 643,000 people in manufacturing in the state. We're the fourth largest of any of the industries in that area. Uh, Pennsylvania is the sixth largest manufacturing state in the United States. And one thing I always throw in, Mark always knows I like to say this, Pennsylvania is also the 17th largest economy in the world. So I mean, it's kind of, when you kind of put that into scale, um, it kind of, kind of sorts things out for you and you recognize just how important manufacturing is. Uh, there is a report, if, I'm not sure if we have enough on every table, but again, from our business development managers, if you need one, please uh, try and get hold of one. It's, uh, it's 
something like this. This is a, an executive uh, briefing. There's also a full report that you can have access to, I guess, at our website. And uh, we can get, see that you get a copy of it. But the important thing I want to make is there's a, there's a button on here called PA Made, PAMade.org. And PAMade.org is a site where you can go either as a manufacturer or non-manufacturer. And you can basically let on PA express your interest and desire that manufacturing is important. And this is information that would go to your legislatures and so on. We, we know that there's budget issues that are going on right now in the state, and we understand that, and, and those things need to be dealt with. But we have to make sure that the number one industry sector in Pennsylvania, which leverages for every dollar of manufacturing sales, it leverages in our $2.52 in other industries. It's the largest of any industry out there. So we really need from, you know, when we look at our mission with DVRC trying to help improve the region's manufacturing base and the quality and lifestyle uh, in this region, it's probably one of the, the fastest ways for us to kind of really accelerate that growth. So if you're interested, if you want to participate, if you go to pamade.org, uh, you can go in there and whether you're a manufacturer or not, you can express your uh, uh, interest in supporting the manufacturing sector. Okay, so again, that's something that, that's in the, uh, in the manufacturing report that we conducted. Um, with that, I know you didn't all come here to listen to me, so, uh, and I, I'm okay with that. Um, but I want to now introduce our speakers, if I may. And um, our, we, the theme we have today is all about growing top line and growing businesses, going after markets and so on. And we have three excellent players who, who really grabbed different aspects of that mission. And uh, we're really excited about having them here. And uh, Mark Rothstein is going to be our first speaker. Uh, from He's president of Prime Synthes. Uh, and he's exploiting new market opportunities with new technology. Mark. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to uh, first thank DVIRC for allowing us to uh, present our case to you. Uh, they've been extremely helpful over the last couple of years, and uh, this is the least we could do to return the favor. Uh, I hope that some of the uh, uh, items discussed will be of uh, some help to you. Uh, I want to begin by uh, telling a true and uh, rather ironic story. Back in 2002, my uh, business partner, uh, Dave, and myself got a visit from a uh, business development manager of a very large specialty chemical company. And he came basically to tell us that they've been buying a lot of product from our primary competitor. They were using it for real interesting uh, purification of a new class of drugs that were being uh, uh, used for cancer uh, chemotherapy. And it was a very high potential uh, market. And he was both uncomfortable with having a single supplier and heard good things about our company and uh, anticipated an explosion in his, uh, in his uh, requirements for this material. So we stopped by. My partner and I did our uh, best to convince him that within a year he'd won us for his primary supplier and that we deserved the business. And we thought we did a good job and things went well. And uh, about a week later when we were waiting for the first trial order to come in, we hear the announcement that they decided to buy our competitor for a ridiculously large premium. And they wound up taking that facility and doubling it in size and in a couple of years, they moved it to Ireland. They doubled again. They're doing extremely well. And the guy who sold his business, he's running around the world uh, with very expensive hobbies and enjoying himself. And uh, on a bad day, my partner and I will uh, stop and wonder if we gave this guy the, uh, the right answer. But I don't want to dwell on this. Uh, <laughs> I'll move ahead with, uh, with the presentation. I will come back and, and revisit this story later during the case, though. 
Uh, in order to understand our business and our product, I'm just going to uh, try and present a uh, five-minute crash course in biomolecular chemistry. I'm sure you're all going to enjoy this. Uh, as, uh, as you're all familiar uh, with the uh, double helix shape of DNA, it's received an awful lot of attention lately. And basically, if you unwind that double helix, you have two strands that can be thought of as a string of beads of four different colors. And those four different colors uh, represent nucleoside bases, smaller molecules, and those of you who speak chemistry uh, can look at the structures there. But the important thing is, is these four letters of the alphabet uh, really encode the way that uh, DNA does its thing and controls uh, all sorts of uh, uh, behavior in cells and in uh, life forms. And so uh, <clears throat> human DNA has two billion of these uh, nucleoside bases uh, from one end to the other. Tremendously complex molecule. And it turns out that uh, scientists uh, discovered how to make small synthetic pieces of DNA, maybe 20 to 200 bases long, and use that as a tool to study the real McCoy. Uh, back in the uh, late 90s, uh, a huge effort was undertaken called the Human Genome Project. Thousands of scientists around the world collaborated to use these small pieces, uh, which are called oligonucleotides, or oligos, if we're, uh, if we're going to get familiar with it. Uh, they used oligos to line up against the uh, real DNA molecule and see where the matches were. So they could construct these sequences with a known uh, order of the four bases. And through trial and error almost, enough of these matches were made and fed into a supercomputer that they were able to um, map out the sequence of human DNA. And uh, it turned out that this effort generated uh, just a wealth of information. There was an explosion of papers being published at that point about what uh, could be done with this information. Uh, new genes were being discovered every week that were responsible for controlling certain disease states. And so uh, this was the opportunity that prime synthesis was uh, founded upon. And uh, where we come into it is uh, as they learned more and more about DNA uh, and made these oligos very easily, uh, a number of interesting products hit the market. Diagnostic kits that could not only tell you if you had a disease, but could tell you if you had a propensity to develop the disease down the road. In addition to that, a whole new class of uh, medicine was developed uh, based on oligos as the active ingredient, so that if you had a flaw in your DNA sequence that caused a medical condition, this little piece of uh, correct DNA sequence could come in and straighten things out. So it's a, a, a theory of medicine that really deals with the root cause of disease. And while it has uh, tremendous potential in over 200 compounds, are in clinical trials today. Only about two have made it through the FDA approval process, but it's a very uh, promising area of uh, medicine. And where prime synthesis comes into this uh, whole story is we make a material which is used to grow these oligos that are being used uh, in so many ways now in genetic engineering. What's so good about the material that we make uh, is illustrated here. If uh, you look at this uh, uh, scanning electron microscope image, zeroing in on our glass powder, just one particle of it, uh, and blowing it up 80,000 times, uh, what we call our product is controlled poor glass, or CPG. We've got a uh, intricate network of very uh, tightly controlled pores that uh, uh, are all through the uh, grain of the material. And what this allows the material to do is have a tremendous surface area for the small amount of material that, that you need. 
And so if you were able to take that uh, CPG uh, grain and stretch it out and get all the nooks and crannies to straighten out, one teaspoon of our material would cover about a 30-foot by 30-foot uh, floor area, surface area. And what this does for you is let you grow a tremendous amount of artificial DNA on a small amount of material, which is what they need to do to make it economically. And this is referred to as the capacity of the material to synthesize uh, DNA. Uh, better yet, we've uh, discovered a way over the last four or five years, we've been working on a way to get four to five times the surface area of conventional CPG. And we're really excited about this because it's going to, first of all, help bring these uh, drugs to market at a more economical price. And that's something that uh, they're always going to drive for in, uh, in new medicine. So with the technical details out of the way, uh, I'll tell you a little about our company. Uh, we're about 20 years old. We're in uh, Aston, Pennsylvania, in Delaware County. We have about uh, 15 employees. And uh, we focus the business on this material to make oligos. Uh, we've traced it through the uh, development of the Human Genome Project. Uh, we now uh, focus on the uh, therapeutic oligo market and selling our material to those uh, drug companies. And this market, even though there are a lot of drugs under development, to do a clinical trial, you don't need to make a lot of drug. You're only dosing a couple hundred patients. So it's been a, a comfortable size market for us to get our arms around with a small company. It's probably uh, somewhere around $20 million worth of uh, material to grow artificial uh, DNA. And uh, it's been under the radar for real big competition until the last couple of years. And then we were blessed with the two very large companies uh, that were foreign. Uh, one was a European company that just got bought recently by GE Healthcare. And the other is a Japanese version of, say, a DuPont or a Dow Chemical in the multi-billion dollar range. So we're blessed with some pretty large uh, and stiff competition right now. So this creates the situation that existed uh, when we uh, began to talk with DBIRC. It turned out that uh, we did have foreign competition that was beginning to eat our lunch because they came in with products of a higher capacity than our conventional uh, CPG material. And while we had a great reputation for jumping through hoops and working with our customers, there's only so much that uh, that kind of allegiance can, uh, can get you. And we were watching the market grow, but very flat sales because our share was decreasing. However, we knew that in the wings we had a new product with a much higher capacity that would leapfrog our competition, and we needed to get that to market as quickly as possible. Once we realized that we had this tremendous capacity on the new product, we suddenly had a flashback to that visit we got in uh, 2002 and realized that this higher capacity material could really do great things in the drug purification market that we seemed to miss the boat on. And at the same time, we got pointed towards that area again because a uh, Korean company had been buying our standard material and demonstrated that it can purify drugs just as well as the big guy's product could. So we, uh, we definitely uh, uh, began to concentrate on whether or not we wanted to uh, play in this market as well with our new improved product. We knew from our experience with the uh, Miss Boat that this was a very large market compared to the one that we were currently playing in because these weren't wannabe drugs in clinical trials. These were blockbuster billion dollar drugs that have already hit the market. And uh, so we were both pleased to see that and a little bit uh, uh, scared to jump right into the market as huge as it was and as small as we were. 
And this is where the DVIRC helped us to figure out both uh, what the bit nature of the business was going to require and formulate, begin to formulate a plan of attack to, uh, to get into this. So the first thing the DVRC uh, brought to the party was a recognition that because we were losing business to foreign competition, we were eligible for something called MATAC funding. The Mid-Atlantic Trade Adjustment Assistance Center actually uh, uh, can do a lot to help a company that's uh, losing business to foreign competition. And it's a matching grant, but with the MATAC money, we were able to accelerate the development of our new product. Uh, we work with more outside labs and consultants to leverage the, uh, the work that we were doing in-house. We also got money that allowed us to begin some patent searches and uh, some new patent applications that would shore up our position for the drug purification uh, business. And uh, we knew that we'd be showcasing the company eventually to partners and uh, we sort of refreshed our website and made sure we had a nice showcase for our new generation product for oligos and also to uh, look good to any potential partners. But the most important thing that uh, DVIRC did for us was introduce us to an organization called the Research Triangle Institute, we'll call it RTI. Uh, they're down in Research Triangle. They've uh, invented the buzzword of uh, technology-driven market intelligence, and they did that for us. And what that really was, was a, a very elaborate and very detailed uh, market opportunity and market research study uh, based on this technology of purifying this new uh, class of drugs. So we explained to them what it was that we had in our R&D department, and then they assigned a PhD who specialized in this area of drugs and purification and spoke the language, and they put together a team of business and technical people that first analyzed about 20 market research uh, articles on this topic, and then they uh, digested 32 technical articles that dealt with the science of these drugs and how they're purified, identified the 37 largest companies in the world that are making these blockbuster drugs, and then conducted 24 interviews with industry experts, experts from academia, and experts in the government like the uh, Federal uh, Food and Drug Administration and National Institutes of Health. So they really did their homework and put together a uh, extremely co comprehensive and useful report. And the bottom line of the report was uh, very uh, uh, exciting to us and scary at the same time. Uh, they found that these drugs are being manufactured as fast as they can and they're still not making them fast enough for the demand. And the bottleneck in how quickly they could make these drugs was, of all things, the uh, purification time that's required. And what would reduce the purification time would be a higher capacity material to purify it on. This was all music to our ears. Uh, they characterized the market as uh, having over $100 billion a year worth of these drugs being sold today with a growth rate of about 30% uh, projected over the next decade. Uh, they also determined uh, indirectly that about $500 million worth of purification media is being sold in this area. And so if you assume that you have a better mousetrap and you're going to break into the market and garner 20% market share, it's not unreasonable to see prime synthesis uh, looking at uh, a hundred million dollar uh, sales potential for the new application for the new product. Now this led us to understand that the business was certainly much bigger than Prime could uh, handle at this time. 
And it also pointed out through the interviews a lot of non-technical considerations. Uh, assuming we had a product that could do the job better, this is a very conservative industry, and a, a Pfizer is not going to entrust the purification of a billion-dollar-a-year drug to a small company uh, to provide the purification media. And uh, the other thing was, if we took our conventional product to get our feet wet in the market, and it only performed as well as the other products, a Me Too product at a lower price just won't cut it. There's no amount of savings that uh, they would risk the, uh, you know, the operation of this new drug manufacturing. And so it, it definitely uh, pointed out that we needed a large, experienced partner if we were going to do this that uh, had a good FDA regulatory track record, knew their stuff, and had connections and contacts within this large pharma area. However, the report was really excellent and uh, was a very credible tool that uh, we plan to use. I think I covered this. Okay. In any event, uh, what we uh, what we realized was the Korean company that was dying the joint venture with us, the best we could come up with was a Me Too product, even at their lower manufacturing cost. We ruled that out and saved ourselves the uh, time and effort that would have been wasted uh, pursuing that. Uh, we also were going to uh, use more of the Maytag funding with our patent uh, lawyers to uh, create a patent landscape and understand who else in the world is working on this problem because it's obviously a very big deal. Uh, the preliminary results on the uh, patent landscape that we attempted ourselves, uh, we just focused on the players who are currently in the market and they're all trying to improve their product in a way to increase its capacity. Uh, none in the, the way that we've done it and none have achieved the level that we feel we, uh, we can do with our product. So it's all very encouraging, but again, this is an ideal job for a Research Triangle Institute to do a, a very thorough and exhaustive uh, uh, investigation of. So a lot's been going on, and we, we got a lot of good help from these initiatives. And uh, here are some of the lessons that we learned as we walked through this. The first was, my first response when we spoke to DVIRC was, this is going to take a lot of my time. I'm going to have to fill out a lot of applications. We're going to rehash a lot of things. And I may be losing focus on our main business uh, while I'm doing this. And as it turns out, this investment of time paid back uh, in a big way and helped to leverage our limited resources and do a lot more uh, with them. It also helped us, as I said, avoid the trap uh, of getting into that joint venture with the Korean company because we need the performance advantage of the new version of the product if we're going to do this successfully. I also know that it's very easy to generate large sales projections in a business plan. And uh, a lot of it's wishful thinking. And a lot of it, if it comes from you, is not nearly as credible as if it comes from an organization in a study like RTI. And so we were very glad that we had this uh, terrific documentation. And then uh, we also realized that uh, there were a number of non-technical barriers that uh, we didn't even think about having a better product alone doesn't always do it. And so we're uh, getting ourselves ready to take the next steps, uh, which is writing a supplemental business plan to our main one that just focuses on uh, this new drug purification opportunity. And we're going to be, be able to back it with a lot of great uh, technical data and business data from the RTI study. Uh, we're going to use the Maytac money to secure some uh, outside laboratories that are experts in this new drug purification area to work with us 
and help us quickly demonstrate the proof of concept of our uh, new uh, material for that application. And at that point, we'll identify some venture capital uh, people to go to, potential large partners, and go to town with the business plan and see if we can't get the appropriate partner uh, to take this market on. Oh yeah, there's one more uh, lesson learned here, and that is uh, if a guy comes to visit you and ask if you're about to sell your company, probably the best answer is make me an offer I can't refuse. <laughs> Thanks for your attention. I have to remember that question uh, when we get asked that time, sometime. Mark, thank you very much. That was really a great, uh, great root overview of, of what happened and, and your path that you're on right now. It also uh, amplifies what I'd indicated earlier about uh, some of the technical research that, that DVRC can, can link you up with. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Bud Tyler. Uh, from EF Precision, uh, and he's uh, going to be covering rebuilding the brand to increase market share. Please welcome Bud Tyler. So I guess we go from the scientist to caveman. <laughs> uh, we'd like to also thank uh, DVRC for uh, allowing me to come up and uh, give our story as well. Um, uh, I've, played a, I've played a small role in the DVRC over the last I don't know, eight, nine years or something like that with the uh, CEO forums, which I think is uh, the biggest bang for the buck that you can get. Uh, if you have somebody from your company that's C-level, somebody's running the company, a general manager, um, I don't think you can get a bigger bang for the buck. You have 15, 16 guys, people, ladies, gentlemen, um, and I use that term loosely because Bob's not here today, that's good. Um, uh, it's, it's having a bunch of mentors that have already been through problems. And when you can get a bunch of people and tell your problem to them and then come up with resolutions, um, the value is just, it's, it's invaluable. And uh, the DVRC has really helped our company with that. So with that, I'll get into a little bit about the EF Precision Group. Um, we've been around since uh, 1977 and uh, started off as a CNC um, machine company, uh, machine shop. Um, we're in Willow Grove, Pennsylvania. We have 85 people. We're in a 65,000 square foot facility. Uh, one of the things that we've come up with over the last, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years is uh, attitude is everything, and that seems to be our 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 mantra. Uh, it really it tells a lot about how our people are, how our company works, uh, the things that we do, and the involvement of our people. So. Um, the, the biggest thing that we've come away with that if uh, uh, we tell our people that if the assets in our company are our people and not our machines, uh, machines may cost a heck of a lot more to, uh, to be there, but without the people, our company's really nothing. Um, we have two companies, actually three companies that uh, form the EF Precision Group. We have EF Precision, which is still our machine shop. We have over 50 CNC machines. Um, that uh, from five axis uh, equipment to um, six axis mill turns, it's, a, it's quite a, um, uh, an array of equipment and basically we've built that on uh, medical aerospace defense uh, businesses and industries that we've been working with. Um, the other company is, a, is an assembly company. So we do, I, I like to call it now, we, we, we used to call it like the, being a contract manufacturer and now we're into like a, being a solutions provider. The, uh, the assembly side of our business um, does everything from soup to nuts. We do from prototype to production. Um, and the thing about the assembly business is that we've done things for uh, Home Depot. We've made all the Keystone shower displays for Home Depot. Um, and that's on the simple side of stuff. And we've also made complex things like pharmaceutical lines uh, for McNeil Pharmaceuticals over here uh, or close to us in uh, Fort Washington. And then we also have an engineering group that's enveloped into the assembly group. And the engineering group is, again, a custom design uh, build company, but we also do the things like uh, we do a lot of re-engineering, or we'll, somebody will bring us an idea on a piece of paper, and we'll turn that idea into a, uh, uh, into a product. 
uh, we're still out there looking for our own product. So if anybody wants to get rid of a product that's really, really doing well, we'll be more than happy to take it over for you. No hands went up there either. Okay. Um, serving the clients. Uh, aerospace, defense, medical, OEM, semiconductor is where we cut our teeth, pharmaceutical. That's basically where we've been uh, hovering around the last uh, three or four years. We continue to invest in trying to develop those areas. Uh, we've stopped trying to be everything to everybody, but we're also trying to be for our customers as much as they want us to be. Uh, one of our things has been to take the no away. Uh, the sales guy goes out and says, nope, we can't do business with you because you're not ISO. All right, 1997, we went out and did ISO. So we became an ISO 9001 company. Um, a few years later, we started getting the, you can't do business with us because you're not registered with the FDA. You're not a contract manufacturer. You're, you're, not, you know, you're not involved in GMPs. We became a registered contract manufacturer. Now we're a registered critical device contract manufacturer. Defense business a few years ago said, if you're not ITAR, you can't do business with us. All right, what's it take to go be ITAR? So you go do a bunch of research and become ITAR. Try to get the ITAR paperwork through in six weeks when your customer's pressing you for an order. Now that's a true problem. Um, it took us about eight to nine weeks just to get a piece of mail through 15 mail stops at the defense companies to get us to ITAR. But they cashed our check within two weeks of having it. Yeah, that's uh, easy stuff. Um, John, just excuse me, do a lot of business with Johnson & Johnson, Lockheed Martin, um, Northrop Grumman. Uh, we're looking at doing some business with Boeing. We do business with Synthase uh, uh, up in Westchester. Um, so we have a myriad of customers that, uh, uh, some, some big names, and we still do businesses with customers that are in our immediate area that are three and four people shops that we've been doing business with them for years. And they don't want all the other stuff. They don't want the ISO. They, don't, they just want us to make parts that we've been making for years, and we still do that. So stay involved in the communities. Um, with our AS, uh, recently, uh, actually two years ago, um, the aerospace companies started being more and more saying, if you're not AS9100, you can't do business with us. Sales guys would come back and say, well, got another no. So we went out and we did AS9100, and we absorbed our company in that. Uh, we literally did the AS9100 certification in under six months. Um, we've just recently passed our AS9100 Rev B in January, and as of January 15th, we were at Rev C. Uh, Rev C is a whole nother level. It's another, I believe it's another 40 different steps from Rev B, and it also involves a lot more, more critiques, uh, more details, more auditing within the company. So now we're at Rev C. We've been working to that. We will get audited to that in, in January. Then the latest one has been the medical companies have come back and said, yeah, it was nice that you went ISO for us, but now we want you to be ISO 13485. Okay. So as of July this year, we will be certified to ISO 13485. Again, taking the no away from the customers is what our ultimate goal is. Um, Mid-90s, yeah, the global competition did emerge. Somewhere along the line, we had a company called Kulik and Safa that uh, had planted a ton of business in with us and kept backing up dump trucks of purchase orders in cash, and we decided that was a good thing to do, so let them be 98% of our business. It's not a good thing to do. Um, 1997, our company did $42 million uh, with 115 people, and uh, in 1999, we were at $23 million after K&S started to move to Singapore, and by the time uh, we realized what was really happening to us, we found ourselves that we had not been very aggressive in our sales. Actually, been lackadaisical. Um, we enjoyed the money that was coming in. Uh, and uh, again, we didn't have a place to turn to. And we had caught ourselves in a, in a bad spot um, that some people get tied into. But with the amount of money that was moving back and forth, the amount of business that was there, uh, we had other customers. Um, but we just didn't pay attention, we lost the ball. So around that time is when I got involved with the DVRC and started talking about, um, you know, how do we get out of some of this stuff? And I attended some of the meetings and the forums is where I started with. So we started to reinvent ourselves. 1990, or I'm sorry, 2005 was probably our low point. Um, we, uh, 
we were pretty close to shutting down the assembly side of our business and uh, not sure what we were going to do with the engineering side. The machine shop is our easiest sell, but for the programs and projects that we work on, they usually take the longest. So um, we had bad sell cycles, we, had, uh, we were tapped out at the bank, we just had some major problems. So we became, we revitalized, we actually restructured our business. Uh, we, uh, we, we took the time out to find out what we needed to do, go out and attack some other companies, attack the business, attack industries, and instead of laying down and turning over, uh, we turned it around. Uh, 2006, actually in uh, March of 2006, uh, we were actually back in the, in the black and um, we started to do a lot new business, a lot more new business and changed over the assembly side of our business, started catching fire with other companies. Our engineering firm was starting to hit some projects and it started working out really well. So uh, we retrained the workforce, got them to understand a lot about, we did some Kaizen events. Uh, we did, and, and again, a lot of this stuff is from the meetings that I was attending, and we we're doing it on the outside because we kept on thinking, ah, we know how to do it better than anybody else because we know our business better than anybody else. And there's a lot of things that happen within lean and within um, doing uh, strategic restructuring, what have you, that if you take the concepts and you take the learned or the out of the book, you can take a lot from that and put that back into your business. And kind of we did that, and we didn't do it structured, so we didn't get there as fast as we should have, and I think now we've gotten past the point that consulting does work. Um, uh, sales to marketing, um, it, it, it hasn't changed a lot from our standpoint. And the hard thing to get through is uh, uh, running with, how do you make yourself better from that standpoint? We still have uh, two direct sales guys that are internal. We have three outside reps. Uh, I do some sales now and then, and uh, basically our people actually are our best salespeople. We know that we knock down 80% of our business if I get a customer inside the house. Uh, we'd rather them talk to the people because sometimes the sales guys or myself or Bill can get into a spot where um, we, get it, we talk by rote. Whereas if you ask somebody in our, our company, you stop and talk to them, they talk from the heart or they talk from what they know. So. You know, we kind of kid with them after they do this. Like, I'll, I'll pay you later when I, you know, see on the on the return route. Um, but that seems to work for us a lot. And having people talk to uh, our customers is a uh, is a big deal for us. And that goes back to who the real assets of the company are. And again, uh, we start focusing on how we were perceived. Recently, we've been focusing on how we're perceived. When somebody mentions EF Precision, the first thing that seems to come to mind is a CNC company, um, high tech close tolerance, complex parts, uh, sometimes they say expensive, I'd argue that. Um, uh, and, uh, but they all know and everybody knows that you're going to get a quality product. And there's really not too many challenges from a machining standpoint that our company hasn't been able to do uh, for people. The problem is, is that our assembly business was starting to erode that our assembly business, if we're 60% assembly and 40% machining, our business thrives. That's where the business really is. When the machine shop starts to be 60% of the business and 40% the assembly side, it, the mix isn't good. So by going through that process, we understood that we needed to revamp, we needed to change the perception and get us out of that pigeonhole. So again, we've expanded a lot of our, our equipment. We've, we've replaced many pieces of equipment inside. We've taken the, uh, our, um, uh, the engineering challenges and the assembly challenges that we've been given, and we still keep finding that we're, we're pigeonholed. Um, so we turned to the DVRC and said, okay, here we are, the company's been around for 30 years. We don't understand why we're not driving business uh, in one area or why the business just drives or why when somebody says EF Precision Group that they think about a machine shop. So after long discussions and some collaboration and me being a pain in the butt about a lot of stuff with the DVRC, uh, they said, well, how about rebranding? You know, that seemed like a good idea. We had to rebrand it for probably 10 years. Uh, we were stale. The website was stale. Uh, our brochures were stale. Even our business cards were stale. I was at a meeting uh, at, the, at one of the forums and, and uh, uh, we had one of our, we have speakers that come in too, by the way, which is very advantageous. 
Um, and the speaker says, everybody take out your card and look at your card. Everybody taking their card out. It's okay, fine. What do you do? The card didn't say anything. It just said our company name. It said what we did, you know, what our phone number is, and all that stuff. But it didn't say what we did. It didn't say CNC machining. It didn't say assembly. It didn't say engineering. It didn't say anything about anything. So that attitude is everything, which is good. I was happy about that. Um, but it didn't tell what it was. So something that simple, we changed our card and put CNC machining, assembly, engineering. At least when somebody picked up their card, they could say, well, I know what this guy does now. They don't know what we are, but they know what we do. So again, something that simple. So the DVRC marketing team, and as you can see, there's Sylvia Weyer and Chris. Um, you know, Chris, I always get your names, Chris Scarfario and, uh, and, and Tony uh, DeFazio. Um, the, the three kind of team together. Tony's kind of our PR guy now in marketing. Uh, I'll get to that story shortly. That's a long one. Um, Sylvia and, uh, and Chris were very instrumental in uh, reshaping the way our company looks, reshaping the way that our website looks, to take the things that I was saying in the caveman language, um, to a point where it kind of was kind of dressed up a little bit. And it took us into a website now that kind of shows that we're not just the machine shop and it's kind of splitting us out. So now our conversations are different. Um, if, we, uh, if we look at how the, um, the marketing or the PR shaped up, uh, Tony had a hard job selling us about PR and ROI, and the two letters don't necessarily go with the three. So uh, Tony spent a lot of time in trying to get me to understand that you're not always going to see an ROI on the PR, except that you might get to the PR in a lot of different places you didn't expect it to. So I've started learning how to take the things that the DVRC group was giving me and trying to turn it around and not just use it as rote, but use it as something that can, uh, can kind of help me. Um, we benchmarked some performances from our clients and opportunities. We created a database um, for some key decision makers, and that was another thing that DVRC got involved with us was uh, to do a, uh, um, uh, a market survey, kind of go out and find out the, the, the different new clients that we could possibly hit, and then do a mailing. And then from that, do a follow-up with phone calls. So we got a database, and I shaped the database into the companies that I wanted to attack. And then the DVRC took the database that I gave them back, and they actually started making the phone calls. So I actually had my built-in sales force, my marketing tools were being handled by them and kind of invisible to me. And then when they got some contacts and key hits for these people, they would come back to me and say, these are people that are very interested in talking to you. Now, out of a 300-man database, 300-person database, sorry, um, we, able, we actually got, I think there was like 25 or 30 that we ended up getting contacts with, that were people that were interested in talking to me or talking about our business. And from that, we ended up willing down to about eight or nine people that were really serious, that would come in and visit us or that I would go visit them. We kind of took the things, the tools that we were given and used them differently. Uh, I don't think the anticipation was to go take all this list and turn them into networking as much as it was take them and learn in the business. We have two of the 300 that are, we're probably going to do business with. Still good, I'm okay with that. But the important part was that the network grew dynamically. Uh, I stay in contact probably with 60 of the 300 um, on a regular basis. And of those people, they continue to get me involved uh, with other things. I've gone down and met Ruben Amaro and, uh, at, a, at a breakfast. I was supposed to go to a breakfast with Ruben Amaro. That's the way it was introduced to me. And there was 300 other people that were there. I don't understand that either. I thought it was just for me. Um, I'm a Phillies fan, so thank God they won last night or this would have really been a bad meeting. Um, so uh, we redesigned, we did brand identification, we went through all that, uh, redesigned the, the, the website, um, we did some 3D animation to it, we've created a, uh, what I think is a better website than we had before. And uh, if you just click that, actually that's still on there, that's good. Um, for now, it kind of, it, it's at the point now where it's, uh, it, it starts out with a design, it goes into an, uh, to the machining, and it creates an assembly. 
so design machining assembly, and that's pretty much what we wanted to convey. This is pretty close to a robot that we made for a semiconductor company, and um, we actually did the design of it. Uh, we did all the assembly for it, and we machined a lot of the parts that went into the actual robot. And the piece that it's actually picking up here is a, a coaster, uh, a, a drink coaster that we actually made on, on our machines. We uh, have come away from uh, um, the, the typical, when we were doing business the old way, the typical Christmas gifts would be you know, a basket or some cookies or stuff like that. And we decided we needed to do something that was from our company. So we started making parts, or we started making machined parts for gifts for desktop items. Uh, this uh, first year we did it was the coffee mug cup, or the, or the, uh, the cup holder. Last year we did a card holder uh, that was made on our five axis machine. And uh, this year we're making something I'm not allowed to talk about or else I'll get killed. Um, but as you can see, the, the nice thing about it is I can change everything in the website. The way that the DVRC helped design this thing was it's so interactive, I can change videos, I can change every single word that's in here, I can update the news every day. Um, I even put that I was doing a presentation here because I'm sure somebody reads the website every once in a while. Um, we're starting to get more hits now than we've ever gotten. Now, is it going to lead to business? I, I'm not sure. I, I, I think it will, it will straighten up some of the problems that we've had. I think the rebranding will work. Um, we're not a B2B company. We're a relationship selling company, which in this day and age is also very tough to do. Anybody that's doing business with aerospace or defense, they have time to answer emails, and that's about it. Phone calls are tough. Meetings are tough. Lunches, forget about it. Um, so the old way of selling is not there, so you have to be a little bit more creative. And one of the things that we did recognize is that we are getting more hits through our aerospace companies. So we're sending out more emails. The PR work that was done this past year, uh, we've had seven or eight or nine articles that have been written in very nice areas, magazines, websites. And what we've done is now we're attaching those to introductory emails, which is starting to open up a lot of stuff uh, for us. So I'll move on to next. We've done a lot of work with Cannondale bicycles. Uh, we talk about the easy things that, uh, that we've done over the years. Uh, we actually make this crank. Started out eight, nine years ago when we were making, uh, we had one machine running uh, probably 20 hours a week. Uh, we now have four machines running 24-5 making bicycle cranks. Uh, this is for Cannondale's high-end bicycles. <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, Cannondale has, has moved. Uh, they've moved almost all of their product offshore. Uh, they're still doing some assemblies up at their facilities, but uh, the crank is going strong, and it's the only thing they haven't moved overseas. So we've been very fortunate to be able to stay with that business. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's been a very good business for us. Um, <clears throat> another help from DVRC that was un unforeseen was that we were actually nominated to uh, be the contract manu or the actually the, I'm sorry the, the manufacturer of the year for the Greater Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce, um, and we ended up winning the award. And uh, Sylvia and Chris had a lot to do with that, and Barry and his group um, were very thankful for that because that was uh, we didn't see it happening. Uh, and when it was time for us to go um, put some of the work into to get it, it was it was a, it was a nice trip. Um, what's come out of that is, uh, again, back to networking, I'm now on the, the, uh, the Greater Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce's Small Business Board and also uh, have been asked to come back again this year as, uh, as one of the, the board members for the Excellence um, Committee. So uh, from my standpoint, it, it, it helps again with more networking, uh, but I get to meet a lot more people in the, in the manufacturing uh, world that's uh, in our area. Uh, Industry Week, Business Journal, um, Bloomberg, Manufacturing News, Design Department, the Intelligencer, all different articles and things that were publicized that, uh, that Tony DeFazio helped us with, and uh, um, it's gained us some exposure. I get a lot of ribbing from that. I don't know why, but I do. Um, there's some of the people in here that sent me some nice emails. Prior to coming here today, it was a lot of fun with those emails. Glad to see there's no tomatoes. Um, so. Uh, Again, facilitated network opportunities, which continues to be the, the number one thing for us. Um, the new, new website, 
uh, the results, our public relations, our coverage for the public relations amounted to somewhere around $107,000 worth of value. Now again, what's the payback on that? Uh, we didn't spend quite that much to get to that value, um, but I can tell you the value of it now, I understand it a lot better. Uh, again, PR doesn't equal, equal, always equal ROI. However, the opportunities that it presents are what you need to take advantage of when you get the opportunities. Um, the lead generation of CEO forums, I can't speak enough about the CEO forums. Uh, I, I just think that that's the, the best thing since, uh, yeah, almost since sliced bread. Um, lessons learned. Talking about public relations, understand that ROI isn't always measurable. It's the awareness gained and how you handle the network that it creates. Uh, and I think that's the most important thing uh, that was pointed out and I continue to point that out. Uh, use all the tools of the toolbox. Everything that, you can, that you're presented, don't just look at it as if ah, that was a great article written or that was a nice thing to have. Uh, put it into your emails, put it into your letters, uh, put it into your conversation. Uh, you'd be surprised that people will come back to you and say, you know, I, I went back and I read that article or I saw that article that you were talking about. And uh, yeah, that was a really nice article that was written. And I didn't know that you did this, even through our conversations, even going through your company, I didn't know that you did whatever was in that article. Uh, don't be afraid to try something new or uncomfortable and be creative uh, it, within your environment. Um, for us, that's, that's a daily event. Um, if, I still like going to work every day, uh, as hard as that's to believe at times, but um, it's enjoyable. Uh, manufacturing is enjoyable. Um, if you were to ask me that when I was a kid, it was like that would probably be the last thing I wanted to do. When I asked my kids as they were growing up, I said to them, and it was a mistake, um, don't get into manufacturing or I'm going to kick your butts. And uh, <clears throat> I got two girls, so at least I had a good reason for doing that. But I'm kind of sorry I did that because I know a lot of uh, um, people that are in, in my age bracket, as old as it's getting, um, I, I believe that there's probably a generation skip that we had, and I think that that's a problem, and I think we need to continue and going back and letting everybody know that manufacturing is not uh, a caveman thing as it used to be. Uh, it still can, it, there's still separation, but I think we've lost a generation, uh, and I'm working hard to, to replace that. Um, don't box yourself into one-way thinking. Again, lead generations, uh, even though that's supposed to be generating customers, I think that can generate a network. And I think from networks, I think that's how you can grow your business. Um, we'll continue to invest in the marketing and support our business development. We're going to continue to look for different mechanisms to, uh, to launch our business and to launch different ways of thinking. Um, building the awareness of the F Precision Group is, uh, is always on my mind on how to how to take it out of this pigeonhole and uh, continue to force out into the world that uh, we're just, we're a solutions provider and we're not a contract manufacturing per se, uh, but we're a solutions provider. Share the knowledge. One of the things that uh, uh, recently talking to the, uh, the, the Montgomery County Community College is to getting out and talking to the, the, the kids. Um, not only, I'd, I'd like to personally do talk to kids in high school, but I think college might be the way to start. Uh, and talk to them about manufacturing. Uh, like Barry said, there are six uh, CEO forums, and each one has anywhere from 15 to 17 uh, C-level people uh, in the forums. And I've talked to them individually, and I've talked to them as a group, and of the 75, 70 guys that are there, they're willing to go out and talk. So I've told the schools this, and now the, uh, the community college, Montgomery County Community College is now thinking about giving us a venue of maybe having a C-level come out once a quarter and talk to kids for 15, 20 minutes in a group uh, to bring back the awareness of manufacturing to tell them that if we don't pay attention now, all these nice things that Pennsylvania is, 17th largest in the world, if we don't continue to promote this with our kids, then we're going to lose the opportunity and 17 could be 25, could be 50, and you know by the time uh, our kids get old enough, we won't have any manufacturing here, which I think is a travesty at this point. So thank you very much for listening, and have a nice day. Thank you, Bud. That was great, um, giving us, everybody a sense of what needs to be done to continue to build your network and grow your business. Uh, without further ado, we're going to move right into our, our, our last speaker. Uh, please introduce Ray Angelo, President and CEO of Westinghouse Lighting. Uh, he's driving sustainable growth through strategic planning. Please welcome Ray.
Thanks. If anyone wants to stand up, it felt really good for me to stand up. So if you want to stand in place for a minute, feel free. Um, I'm a Phillies fan and a Flyers fan. I had a tough night in Minneapolis that last night. I was a couple of days in the uh, Midwest, one of those creeping mechanical delays. So I'm watching the Flyers game, and that didn't help any, but departed about midnight Philly time. But uh, this was an energizing uh, meeting to be in and always learn, you know, from the presenters. And, uh, Bud, what you were sharing, um, there's so much to learn from other businesses, and uh, it's, it's just a great forum. So I'll keep it moving along. Uh, A little bit of uh, Westing, we're Westinghouse Lighting now, and I'll share some of our history. But we're, um, we're, we have excellent brand recognition as Westinghouse. Uh, I won't read it. I think you can all see the slide pretty well. Uh, very, uh, even though it's a brand that has uh, lost some luster because it was a great American brand and basically sold off its manufacturing divisions over time, but still has very good awareness, 40-plus uh, age group, and we're trying to reinvigorate it with the younger age groups. Um, the business roots, though, we were started in 1946. Uh, my father and uncle, we were Angelo Brothers Company from 1946 until 2003. So we've always been in lighting, that's the only business I've been in, and it's um, similar to, I think, you know, what the presenters had, probably everybody in this room. I think one of the things that drives a lot of us is keeping the business relevant, keeping it growing, and, um, uh, you know, we're 65 years in business, and as I will cover, it's, it's, it's challenging. We've been through a, a, a tough uh, three- to five-year stretch. Uh, today, rough numbers, uh, annual sales, 100 million plus. We employ 250 people. Um, our product lines in broad terms are light bulbs, ceiling fans, and decorative uh, and replacement parts. Uh, good chance some of you have our product, you know, in your homes. Um, our, our real, if you boil us down, we're basically a global marketing and distribution company. Uh, one of the things uh, I'm working on in our senior team is as the, the world is changing dramatically, but the lighting world in particular is going through revolutionary changes. Uh, you all probably have the spiral light bulbs in your homes now. You never had them. You know, most of you didn't have them five years ago. Uh, that's compact fluorescent technology. Uh, not quite as complex as DNA. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, the miniature miniaturization of the linear fluorescent into that small consumer product um, required quite a bit of engineering. And now you're hearing about LEDs. LEDs are now coming on the market. Uh, they started, they came out of the semiconductor industry, so we sort of have two industries converging. And they originally were good for directing light and more for indicators. You see a lot of them, obviously, automotive, tail lights. Most traffic lights are now LEDs. Uh, very energy efficient and long lasting. Uh, so we're, we're in this, we're a small company in a very big global industry. And what we're finding is we need to uh, really bring innovation and align with uh, either uh, inventors or small companies that uh, we can help bring their product to market. Um, uh, currently, we're, we're based in Philadelphia. Uh, we have sales and distribution in Montreal, in, in Dusseldorf, Germany, Mexico City. We have a joint venture in uh, Panama, which um, we had tried to enter the Latin American market as a U.S. company. And uh, we learned the hard way that it just wasn't a fit. We didn't know the business culture, didn't speak the language. And then to try to manage it from Philadelphia, uh, a lot of lessons learned there. So we, um, uh, 
uh, we developed a relationship. We had a long-standing customer relationship with a, um, a Panamanian-based company, and uh, they liked the Westinghouse brand. They saw a huge potential in Latin America for that brand. So we formed a joint venture, and uh, uh, that's one of the uh, bright spots of, uh, of our portfolio right now. U.S. distribution, as you can see there, um, uh, around in, in you know, Philadelphia, Chino, and uh, Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, we've had to um, expand our sourcing and QC effort on the ground in China. So we have about uh, 20 people based in mainland China. Chang'an is in the, uh, in the southeast part of China where there's heavy lighting, ceiling fan, lamp making, uh, base of business. Um, and then we have five people in Hong Kong and two in Taiwan. Uh, the lighting business, as I'll move along here, uh, really shifted. Philadelphia used to be a hotbed of lighting. I mean, there were lighting manufacturers in Philadelphia. We fed off of that industry, supplied at some of the smaller manufacturers, pretty much from New York to Baltimore, uh, a tremendous amount of um, uh, lighting manufacturing. Over time, though, however, a lot of lighting uh, has uh, migrated offshore, and uh, China is the powerhouse right now. In the industry, lamps is, is the industry term for light bulbs. So did I hit a button? OK, it'll come up. So lamps is the industry term uh, for light bulbs. Luminaires is the industry term for lighting fixtures. And ceiling fans are ceiling fans. Uh, I think we all know them, probably have them in our homes. Rough uh, uh, cut at, uh, at our business, we have the three categories that I just described. And our two main customer bases are B2B. So in an area like that, that would be like a Billows Electric, a company that is supplying product to manufacturers or contractors. Then the other side, the retail side, that would be the Home Depot, the Lowe's, uh, Amazon.com, people like that, companies like that, I should say. Through our history, um, we um, while we had the opportunity to become Westinghouse in 2003, hindsight, we confused our customers when we did that because we were a well-known lighting company. Everybody knew us. Privately held firm always was in lighting. They knew the Angelo uh, name in lighting. It wasn't a consumer name, but in the industry, they, they knew us. When we became Westinghouse, uh, which we were the, the leading candidate as Westinghouse exited lighting, we were able to pick up the, the brand, but many of our customers thought we had gone out of business or were, had sold the business, or uh, we now were part of some multi-billion dollar company, when in effect we were the same small mid-sized company we had always been. Um, and it took us a while and some of the work that I'll be sharing uh, to regain our company identity while we had this global brand. So we, we did some um, independent research on us to just get a, uh, a perspective on how our customers and how do consumers look at us. And what they landed on is our company is, is a company that companies like to do business with. There's, a, there's an affinity to our company different than some of our competitors are more known for their product leadership. So uh, some of the giants in, our, in lighting, like GE and Philips, we've been able to uh, grow, in, in, I use the term the land of the elephants. They're so big, huge companies, excellent companies, tremendous R&D. So our sales declined as we, uh, our sales with um, some of the major home centers uh, it was a steady erosion. We would bring them new products with new designs, and we would hold on to those products for about a year, but then they would find factories in China because they have huge buying staffs now, all the major you know, international companies, Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart. They have uh, tremendous capability you know, in China. 
So we were sort of stuck in this, we were innovating, bringing these products, and then we would get, you know, maybe a one-year run out of them, and then be scrambling to place new product, and eventually all the A and B items, I think we all are familiar with that, were pretty much being sourced directly, and we were left with, you know, trying to uh, uh, sustain our business on the, uh, on the C items. It was very challenging. So we had a tough... You know, 1946 through the mid-80s, you know, nice growing, you know, scenario. And uh, then from the mid-80s, you know, through now, it's been much, you know, much more challenging. Our growth has been choppy. Um, and um, it became clear uh, to me in, in 2009 that we really needed to focus uh, our strategic direction because... The, uh, the competitive forces were only going to get more challenging, and we had this opportunity to use the brand of Westinghouse to really differentiate ourselves. So we were in this glass half empty, glass half full stage. Uh, we were able to keep, you know, because we, we have a stable ownership group, very competent management team. We were always able to keep stabilizing the company, but we couldn't get sustainable growth going. Um, so we, uh, we really had to make some deeper changes. Uh, Harold's a nice picture of you right there. We, we met uh, some of the folks at DVIRC. It's kind of funny, literally around the corner from our building. We're in the uh, Byberry East Industrial Park. And I had known DVIRC about 20 years ago, but uh, we weren't as open-minded as looking outside at that time. Plus, DVIRC didn't have quite the offering that uh, Barry, you and your team now have. So uh, when we found out, you know, with the capabilities of DVIRC and um, people like Harold in this case, what, what our need was, uh, I preferred, and I knew it would work well with my management team, someone that comes out of business and operations. And Harold has a very extensive background and knows what it's like to be responsible for, uh, you know, a part of a business. He was with Roman Haas, and uh, that registered well, you know, because we, we had some experience in the past with consultants that either were pretty much consultants their whole lives or had been out of um, manufacturing or distribution for such a period of time that they weren't quite relevant. So we were... We found a good fit uh, with Harold and uh, helped me greatly because I was, uh, I think for any of us that if you're, you know, you're trying to, you know, be part leader, part manager and deal with market forces, it's great to have a competent independent facilitator in some of the management team meetings because it, it uh, for in my particular case, it allowed me to focus more on the business issues and you know Harold Harold was there right at my side to be sure that there was clarity in what we were talking about and that follow up uh, could occur cuz as we all know you know ideas or plans aren't anything if you don't implement them and follow up on them so uh, we went through this process uh, uh, strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats and we created a plan uh, set goals and uh, the action plans was something in particular uh, we, we, ha we got high value out of. Um, I had gone through, we've had a number of strategic planning uh, experiences over the years, but this particular one had the most uh, effect afterwards. We really, Harold brought some tools that are very basic, uh, simple, but effective in taking the plans down into understandable one-page uh, action plans with somebody owning each, each task and each timeline and having it link all together. So uh, that was helpful. Um, some of what I think uh, we all know is important. We had to really focus on core competencies and uh, competitive advantages so we could focus on where we could win. Uh, and we identified gaps in where maybe our plans made sense, but we really 
didn't have uh, practical steps to implement them. So then we said, all right, you know, Harold will help us say, well, if you really want to do this, let's get serious. How are we going to accomplish it? So it's a, it's a good sorting out prof process because it, um, it can help create that focus. Sometimes you can try to tackle more than you can really handle. I think it, it, once you get in that creative process, uh, you, you need that discipline of, okay, keep it real. Now, that's great. You came up with these eight things. Can you really do them? Or what are the two or three that are going to really move the company forward? Uh, we identified short-term issues. Uh, we actually had to step back a bit uh, when it was clear that um, we had to just stabilize the company a bit. We, we came up with this term defensible line because we said, all right, this is great. We, we do see growth potential, but we're not going to get to the next five or ten years if we don't take care of the year we're in and make sure that uh, we're, uh, we're solidly positioned to handle the growth. So we had some real tough, you know, tough questions, a lot of open dialogue around the state of the business, and then this realistic and achievable plan emerged. While, while this was going on, Harold joined us when we were actually about midway through a performance management plan that uh, was really um, supported fully by the management team. Uh, we had done probably what a lot of you in this room have done goal setting, uh, you know, HR, uh, have the reviews twice a year, make sure it's documented. And, you know, we, I would give us like a, a B minus grade. But we weren't, it wasn't translating into business results. And that's where we got more focused on performance management that links the business goals down to every, it's not everybody in the company right now, it's about 110 of top management on down to about 100, you know, 110 with clear goals on their performance review with the focus of, look, you're going to be more successful as, a, as, an, as an employee and as a team member if you're really driving what the senior management team is, is looking for. And it really helped clarify what people were doing so that it was adding value in the enterprise. And uh, with all this, by the way, uh, in no way am I standing here in, the, in a best practice mode. To me, this is all work in process, that it's, it's continual learning each step of the way. But for us, it finally clicked as a company that the strategic plan has to have these tactical operational plans, and then every employee has to be linked to them. So it's a, it's a very uh, engaging process, and um, each, uh, each review cycle that we go through really has new meaning for, the, uh, for each team member. A lot of learning about the business and how each of us can add value. While this is going on, we also are going through a major IT conversion. Uh, we have a, a legacy IT system. It goes back to the digital equipment ages. Some of you may remember digital equipment. <laughs> they no longer exist. But our, our mainframe was actually a, a 1980s mainframe. So we're, we're in the process. Uh, hopefully it happens Memorial Day weekend to uh, cut over to a Microsoft-based uh, uh, integrated system. Um, financial budgeting was another process similar to what I had mentioned uh, on the PMP process from a, a, a people standpoint. We punched up our budgeting so that it, 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 it changed from being that annual, okay, time to do the budget, you know, mentality to actually have it being part of the business. We expected much more of our middle managers to understand the expenses that, that they were responsible for and have real ownership around them, once again, linking to the performance management plan. So that was a you know, nice, uh, tangible metric to make the link. Uh, another uh, effort, we realized that we need to upgrade our, our presence on the internet. 
uh, with our product because we have the chance with this global brand to really penetrate worldwide markets. So we've had a massive uh, effort underway to build the content um, that is relevant to consumers that are going on the internet. Our content was very trade oriented. So our customers knew what our content meant if we described a product, but it didn't make sense to consumers. They couldn't really understand it. So we're, uh, we're uh, ready to launch this, uh, this new website uh, within the next four weeks. We have a, um, an industry a trade show called Light Fair. It's the first time it's going to be in Philadelphia. It's typically always in New York or Las Vegas, but uh, Philadelphia has it this year, so we're excited about that. Um, I think I covered this, the first bullet where we have these plans now that uh, we're really able to track and monitor uh, our progress, and it, it allows for mid-course correction because it's inevitable if you have linked plans and a um, certain amount of capable people that are trying to implement multiple plans, those pressure points emerge, and there needs to be some realistic adjustments of timelines or priorities. And that's the second bullet there. And it's allowing us to focus on, on the major initiatives. Um, we punched up our communication. We're using an, in, um, an intranet portal to communicate on a regular basis uh, what's going on in the company. Uh, performance management piece, I think I cupped, uh, covered that. Um, we were surprised the employees um, really were much more eager and enthusiastic, especially the managers, because we've gone through a painful five-year period where uh, we had to reduce our staffing to stay competitive. You know, we sort of had a, um, a bloated fixed cost structure from all those uh, growth uh, days in the 80s. And as we all know, it's so easy to add fixed costs going up but so difficult to ratchet them down when, when need be. So I, a lot of our managers who had, you know, lived through those tough times, uh, you know, of letting people go and, you know, people that you knew were good workers, but they weren't adding value because our business plans changed. They sort of got that, hey, you know what, if we really do link these goals to performance, it's a win for everybody. So. Um, uh, it's a constant challenge, but a real shift culturally uh, it was a benefit of going through the, uh, the tough times. I covered that bullet. Um, an indication of uh, the employee ownership we formed uh, for this IT conversion, we took some of our best managers and took them out of operations for about a year, and they have a separate area in our office as a team to make sure this conversion really can take care of business and challenge our thinking so that we, uh, we don't do things the old way on a new system, but actually look, look at some of the new technology and adapt our business to the new technology. And um, we actually, the team, uh, landed on the Memorial Day weekend to do the conversion because it gives us an extra day of downtime to do it, and it a uh, good demonstration of their commitment to see this project through and also have it fit the needs of the business. Uh, the new website's coming up this month in a, in a, few, in a few weeks. Um, we, we're... We're going to tighten this metric up. It's, it's, it's a little vague right now, but our customers, uh, even though the, the, the website isn't fully launched, we've put some links to our existing website. So as an example, our customers can go to our website, click on any one of our catalogs, and it's got a nice graphic where the pages turn, you know, similar to like they turn on like a Kindle. You know, so it's, uh, it, we're, we're able to... Uh, really be in the modern age from an information standpoint, but it took a lot of back, uh, back room work to get it to that point. I'll cover these real quickly. Um, my, uh, the lessons learned from me and, and the team, 
and, and this one emerged when I was prepping for this, uh, for, for today, strategic planning, if any of you are going to, you know, really take a serious run at it, I'm sure some of you have, and I, th I think it's something we all have to periodically do. The, the higher the value placed on it by whoever the owner or president is, depending upon the company, or if it's a publicly owned company, the senior management team, I've learned, you know, over the years that if that buy-in at the top isn't there, don't even do it. It's, it almost is a waste of time because you can put all that time and energy, but then in the following through's not there, or it's, it's not aligned when you go to implementation, it just creates a lot of stress for the, the people that are doing the real work, you know, in the implementation. So um, uh, it's certainly valued. I, I've lived through it. This was the, this was the uh, best experience I've ever had because there was a real buy-in at the top. Uh, point two for me, it's, I, I see it now as it's an essential process for us. Uh, it does need to be a living, breathing plan. And in the late 80s, early 90s, we had done some work, but then the plan just sort of sat on the desk. And maybe some of us referred to it. But if I, I'm a, a believer in if you, to get the value out of all that work, it's got to be linked to the people in the organization. And that's where the, the action plans and the, and the link to each individual goals come in. Um, I covered point four. Point, point five, uh, uh, I, I learned this was another lessons learned the hard way. I think we can all relate to this. Because of the roots of our company was entrepreneurial, and it worked when we were smaller. You know, we could add a product, talk to a customer, yeah, we'll get that for you. We pretty much never turned down an opportunity. If a customer wanted something, we figured out a way to bring it to them. As we grew and the product line grew, we, we grew a little bit like Topsy. You know, we had 5,000 plus items. Uh, we were trying to be all things to all people. So we, um, th this chart comes out of some of Dr. Deming's work where we were the classic company where we did very little planning, sometimes none, and the implementation took so long and it was so costly. Rework and, oh wait, I thought the customer wanted this. No, this is what they wanted. And so now we're, we've shifted to more slow things down. If something's strategic or it really is a big opportunity where we're, we, it, we, we should be around the table talking about it, then let's talk about it. Get it laid out. And then what we found is the implementation goes much shorter so therefore, you reach the goal line quicker and with less cost. So um, we've, we've lived both sides of that. Um, something else I learned is um, if, you're going to, if you're going to do strategic planning, uh, a group size of four to eight seems to work best. There's something about group dynamics. You get less than four. My view is you don't get enough of that. Uh, fresh thinking or a real perspective. We used to do that as owners. There'd be three of us as owners and we weren't really doing any strategic planning. Then we went to where we had a dozen or more people in the room. That doesn't work. It just gets, uh, it's just too difficult a group to work with. So I would recommend four to eight. Uh, it's clear for who, who's ever in the lead of the process which, I, as I said earlier, needs to be the lead of the company as well for most effectiveness, is you got to create that open collaborative atmosphere. you got to really be willing to hear the bad news and create that safe environment. But then the flip side is, what I found is, that then creates more ideas than can be effectively handled. So then you almost have to shift gears a bit, and this is where a facilitator can really help and then focus in on what I would say is two to four initiatives. If you have more than four strategic initiatives, I doubt that anyone's really strategic because it's just too hard to, you know, to implement for companies like ours, small, mid-sized companies with the resources we have. Came across a quote that uh, seems to fit uh, is, you need to separate the vital few from the needed many. I've seen it, you get a group together of people that care about the business 
the, the ideas just come out, and they're all good ideas, but they're not all vital. So you've got to really discern what's really needed from what's a nice to have. Uh, communication uh, is extremely important. A lot of that depends on the size of the company. For us, with uh, people around the world now, we found that we needed to do much more uh, on, the, on the intranet so our people could you know, actually stay in touch because we just can't be uh, everywhere. Uh, certainly, it's always easier if you're in one location and you have a, a group you can talk to like this. Uh, that's always the most effective. Um, all performance starts with clear goals. Another one of those sounds so obvious but we went through years of thinking we were doing it, but the goals really weren't clear, and we weren't really performance-oriented. We weren't really living it day in, day out. Uh, what I landed on that seems to be working in, 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 at Westinghouse Lighting is we have a, th a rolling three-year plan. Uh, for our business and the lighting industry right now, uh, going out five years plus, it's, it's like dreaming. You're, you're trying to, I, I just can't see the value out of it. You know, we're not capital intensive. I know for certainly for, depending upon the company, it, it fits. For our company, a rolling three-year plan works. So every year, there are, we, we, we share through the company, here's what we accomplished, and here's where we're headed. And it seems to have a nice flow to it. Um, we're now, we're in the next steps mode now. We're clearly uh, in a stronger position to implement additional initiatives. What we're focused on now is um, really looking at positive cash flow, the inventory we carry, the markets we're playing in, still working on sustainable fixed cost. I think we all deal with that. You know, it's that uh, constant challenge of uh, having to fix match the business. And we see great opportunity to capitalize globally uh, on, the, on the brand. Our best growth areas the last three years have been outside the U.S. Uh, Latin America in particular has been growing nicely. Um, we're looking at new product development in a different way. We're actually working uh, with DVIRC in, in that regard. Um, uh, Peter Bresler has just uh, joined the staff, and uh, he's, uh, he built a, a nice Philadelphia-based firm in product management, and uh, we're tapping into his expertise to see how we can uh, improve that effort. So that's pretty much the current status, and uh, pleasure seeing you all. And a big round of applause for our speakers and for their time and, and, and their ability to share in this series. And, and events like this don't uh, just happen. Uh, you know, the, the staff at DVIRC, I'd like to ask all of them to stand. They've all contributed in, in one way or the other. So everyone from DVIRC, if you wouldn't mind uh, standing up. We have Harold and people in the back. Yeah. And, and we invite you to, to stay and, and uh, network. Uh, as part of the, the sharing aspect that we want to definitely encourage. And also there's food, there's coffee, and uh, thank you very much. It was a great day. Thank you.